Dear audience, respected panelists, I'm honored and more than happy to welcome all of you to today's panel discussion, which is part of the Conference on Religion and the Role of Self-Reflection. Organizing such an event needs the tremendous support of friends and family, as well as the speakers, who took their time to make this event possible. I want to thank all of these people, and especially everyone here in this room, for making their time today to come here and be with me. And I also want to thank ISOC, the Islamic Society of Oxford, who did um, support me in many ways, but they're also uh, co-hosting the event today. And actually, they're recording right now. <laughs> so, but coming back to the topic, why did I actually organize this event? I'm a visiting graduate student at St. Anthony's College here in Oxford, and my PhD research is based on resilience and religiosity of young German Muslims. The notion of self-reflection plays an essential role in my research, as it is connected to both resilience and religiosity. And while critically engaging myself with self-reflection, by obsessively reflecting on each and every aspect of my thought and behavior, it did become quite an overwhelming burden. And yet I firmly believe that if all of us reflected upon ourselves just a little bit more, we would become healthier and happier human beings. Which is why I felt the urge to emphasize the notion of self-reflection in our current academic discourses on religion, religiosity, and identity. Before I will hand the word over to my uh, colleague Wala Kouise, who is a PhD student at Oxford University and also moderating today's panel discussion, I would like to conclude my introduction with a verse of a poem by Muhammad Iqbal, a renowned Mm, philosopher and poet of the 20th century. What is religion? To rise up from the face of dust so that the pure soul may become aware of itself. With this in mind, let's hope for a rewarding Saturday afternoon. And now, dear audience, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our distinguished speakers. I'll try not to take up too much of your time so we can have time for uh, questions, inshallah. Um, but this is a very important topic that we need to ponder on a little bit, especially as students of faith. Self-reflection in the Muslim tradition was seen as the ultimate state of being for a believer. If you are not conscious of yourself, your actions, your intention, and the state of your heart, both as an individual and as a community, uh, the winds can take you wherever they please. It is narrated in a hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Whoever so knows himself knows his Lord. This isn't a simple quest for identity. Rather, it is an existential question on which your actions should be based. I'm really honored to present to you tonight our distinguished speakers. Any introductions I give tonight will ultimately fall short. Nonetheless, I will try to do my best. Uh, Dr. Talal Al-Azm is a Muhammad, fellow, uh, Muhammad Nawab Fellow at the Oxford Center of Islamic Studies. Dr. Talal is from a select group of remarkable scholars who have successfully combined both the classical and the academic approach to Islam, to the study of Islam. His research interests include Islamic law and jurisprudence, medieval Muslim education and historical transformations of institutions and concepts from the late medieval into the modern period. Dr. Talal has many publications, from among them, a Mamluk Handbook for Judges and the Doctrine of Legal Consequences, and the Transmission of Adab, Educational Ideals and Their Institutional Manifestations. Uh, Professor Tariq Ramadan is a world-renowned scholar of contemporary Islamic studies. Besides teaching here at Oxford, he is also a visiting professor at the Faculty of Islamic Studies in Qatar at the University of Malaysia. He is also a senior fellow at Dushisha University in Kyoto, Kyoto sorry, and a director of the Research Center of Islamic Legislation and Ethics in Doha, Qatar. Professor Ramadan has authored many books, both in English and in French, and has been translated in many world languages. Books such as Radical Reform and The Quest for Meaning have influenced a whole generation of Muslims in the West, 
as well as in Muslim majority countries. As a public intellectual, Professor Ramadan engaged directly and from the grassroots level with Muslim and non-Muslim communities in the Anglophone, Francophone, and the Arabic-speaking worlds on critical issues. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Nigel Fanfor, who is the course director for the MSc in Learning and Teaching. Dr. Fanfor brings together an interdisciplinary approach. Not only has he studied theology and social anthropology at a master's level, Dr. Nigel also worked as a researcher at Warwick and a teacher at Lord Williams School. Dr. Nigel's research interests include religion and secularities in education, dialogue in education, teachers' professional learning, and the uses of research in schools. Dr. Nigel has numerous publications on the topics of religion and education from among them, the classification and the framing of religious dialogues in two, education, in two English schools, and redefining, uh, redefining learning about, educate, about religion, Sorry, redefining learning about religion and learning from religion, a study of policy change. Um, so the template of today, will, uh, each speaker will have 30 minutes and I will tell you when you're 15 minutes uh, into the discussion, five minutes and then two minutes. And I uh, would like to start with Professor Ramadan, if you'd like. this morning, uh, Amina, and all you, the work you have been doing over the last uh, weeks and months, and uh, for that, also for this introduction, and for all of you for coming on, on a Saturday and thinking and trying to think together about uh, self-reflection and, and self-criticism. Uh, my take on the topic was, I, I thought from the beginning that it was more about self-criticism than self-reflection, but in fact, I would... Uh, try to combine the two uh, perspectives because I, I really think that there is nothing that we can get when it comes to understanding self-reflection from within the Islamic uh, tradition if we don't go also to self-criticism which is also a, a perception that needs to be uh, uh, addressed uh, in a way which is a, a comprehensive way. So. Uh, when it comes to, uh, and this is an introduction, once again, half an hour to discuss such uh, a, a deep topic, it's not enough. But let me just try to structure it uh, uh, through first, say something about uh, the understanding from within the tradition of, of self-reflection -re from an Islamic perspective, uh, and in which way, uh, from our understanding, this is important. Anything which has to do with, uh, if you go through all the, the, the legacy, the, the, the great scholars or even the philosophers, in all the great schools of thought, if you uh, uh, try to get a sense of what the uh, Mutakelli mean was saying, in what has to do with uh, uh, this understanding of theology and philosophy at, uh, at the same time. Al-Falasifa, the, the philosophers that were coming from the Islamic perspective, as well as the Fuqaha, the jurists. There is something on which there is a common ground, understanding that whatever is their field, the very essence of the teaching in Islam has to do with self-reflection, coming back to the self and trying to understand. The, the, the question that we had in many sciences were, what are the rules to which and the path to which we have to go to get this understanding of how do we deal with the self. And um, uh, once again, I, I, I don't want to forget the, the, the mystical tradition, the Sufi tradition, which from the very beginning was putting this at the center of the spiritual journey. Uh, saying what? Saying that at the very moment, and, and this is something that we have in the, 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 the very essence of the Islamic tradition, at the moment there is an acknowledgement that uh, there is one God the understanding of the Tawheed as the center of the Islamic teachings. Uh, coming back to God will be coming back to the self. Coming back to the self is the way you are pondering over your relationship with God. 
So, uh, and how? How are you going to get this from the Islamic perspective? And once again, you will find this in uh, all the, the, uh, the different schools of thought. Uh, uh, the very essence of this self-reflection is at the moment you acknowledge that there is one God, that you, you acknowledge and you say you enter into Islam by saying La ilaha illallah. The starting point of this journey has to do with education and self-education. And the, 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 the essence of education has to do with this self-reflection, is how do you come back to the self and you try to improve and any in all the ways. So the centrality of the Tawheed is the centrality of education in the Islamic tradition. And once again, this is why I think that sometimes with all the different schools of thought that we have, uh, it's quite scattered, there are divisions, sometimes there are priorities that we have put in. Uh, in our different sciences, and I will come this, to this when it comes to self-criticism. I think that the self-reflection is the, the way we have to deal with uh, uh, our understanding of uh, what is the meaning of education. There is one saying coming from the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, I was but sent only to, to uh, complete the good character. So, in fact, the very essence of this mission is, I came with a mission uh, reminding the people that there is only one God. But my message and my mission to the people is to complete the good characters and the best behavior. So, meaning that there is an ethical centrality in anything which has to do with the Islamic uh, uh, message. And this ethical centrality of la ilaha illallah has to do with the way you are going to change your behavior. But the way you are going to change your behavior is the way you are going to change the self. So self-reflection in, in, in this way is something which has to do with the way you have to deal with the self and to try to improve the self in order to come close to God. So how is this process of self-reflection when it comes to our spiritual life. And you know, spirituality in, in English, we don't really have a word in Arabic which is exactly the meaning of spirituality. We can use the rohaniya, which is uh, the way you keep the spirit with it. You can also uh, use tazkiya, uh, which is the purification of the self. And uh, we also are using a word that is coming from the Quran, kunu rabbaniyin, be full of this uh, God's presence and the way you are connected to God. And everything which has to do with this, the skiatidnaf, the purification of the self, are And it's connected here by the way you were teaching the book. So the way you were learning from this process is all connected to self-reflection is going, it's, it's only possible if you go through the process of getting this education and the knowledge of the self and the knowledge of uh, your being and to free yourself from your own ego. So you can see here that what we have as the starting point of the whole discussion about self-reflection is what we find at the center of all the Sufi and mystical traditions. But I would say it's not only in the mystical tradition that we find this. We find it everywhere. All the discourse that we have, for example, in Miskawe's work, when it work, when it, it comes to happiness, is sa'ada, is something which is taken from the Greek tradition and brought into the discussion within the Islamic tradition. Is all part of this happiness, and he is the one, Miskawe, who tried to reconnect the. Uh, Aristotle and, and Plotinus' uh, uh, legacy with the Islamic tradition by coming to uh, uh, reconnect this happiness with God's love, which is all based in the Sufi tradition and in the philosophical tradition here uh, uh, on the, 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 the process of educating the self and through this education of the self is the self-reflection which is necessary. So at the end, if we come to uh, all this tradition and try to understand in which way they are uh, uh, connected and all these uh, different Islamic sciences, at the center of this, the oneness of God has to do with education and there is no education without self-reflection at every step of your personal journey. 
So the personal journey, and this is what, once again, we can find this uh, among the uh, philosophers, where in this tradition of the, the philosophers from El Kindi and Farabi to the point that we can find, for example, what was produced in a very interesting way by Ibn Tufayl in his book, Hay uh, Ibn al it's a, a, a philosophical novel putting at the center of this evolution of the self, the self-reflection on how do you deal with the meaning of life, how do you deal with your mind, how do you deal with rules even, because this is what we need to get a deep understanding that there is no production of Islamic law, if there is no self-reflection on the way the law should serve your personal uh, uh, evolution and spiritual evolution and not the opposite. The law are here to serve, the law are means to the uh, uh, most important end, which has to do with the improvement of the self, the improvement of the being, at the personal level and at the collective level. The confusion here and this is why it's important to keep self-reflection as the center of the spiritual and the teaching uh, of Islam and not the other sciences. The other sciences are here also to serve something which is the, 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 the very meaning of the spiritual journey. Now, when it comes to what I was saying about the philosophical uh, 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 tradition, el mutakallimin in the way they were trying to get, for example, a sense of uh, 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 how do we get ethics, for example? Is it uh, uh, something that is coming from our rationality, or is it coming only uh, through the books and through the revelations? At the end, the very uh, question about the source of uh, ethics, it's an important one, the source of morality. Why? Because what is important in, in the process is how you're going to deal with God, how you're going to deal with the self, and how, how you're going to improve your uh, spiritual uh, journey and uh, your understanding of this relationship with God and the relationship with your fellow human beings. So the discussion about the sources of ethical values is deep in this uh, discussion about what am I going to be? How am I going to deal with myself uh, when it comes to getting the knowledge and getting this deep uh, uh, understanding of how I have to evolve from uh, a spiritual perspective? My take on all this, and starting with the, the big picture of all the sciences, is to connect this with uh, 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 something which I think it's, it's important in... Uh, in uh, this uh, self-reflection uh, and the understanding of self-reflection, dealing with our texts, but dealing also with uh, our uh, uh, legacy and what is a Torah, the legacy among us. And this is why I think that uh, uh, while we are making it something which is a personal endeavor, a personal journey, I think we should not in the way we deal, and this is where I'm, I'm touching something which is very sensitive in our legacy, very often our sense of uh, self-reflection is disconnected from our take on self-criticism. And I would say that this is why we have to reconnect the two, the spiritual dimension and the intellectual dimension. And to understand that in the way we are dealing with self-critical approach towards the text and towards the context. This is the way we are deepening our understanding of self-reflection in our time. Because the priorities of self-reflections in a specific time could be different depending where we are. We keep on repeating sometimes the same essential teachings, but the point that we are living in different contexts with different challenges, is uh, these are changing the way we also have to deal with but there is no self-reflection which is in the void. We always deal with the specific environment that we have to deal with. And, and this is what I would say, I, I, I want to uh, just uh, say a few things about, uh, about this, which once again is not new, but it's essential. Self-reflection, it's not something which is natural, and there is a word in the Islamic tradition which, has, which is completely distorted, which is the roots of uh, jahada, jihad, and ishtihad, and, and a very uh, clear understanding that the effort the, 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 the somebody is exerting to try to get 
truth in himself, jihad in nafs, to try to reform the self, and each jihad tried to find the right answer for the challenges of our time. The same root is both connected to the heart and connected to the, the intelligence, the intellect. And when it comes to this, uh, the, 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 what is important in, in our tradition is to come to the essence of our relationship as an introduction to this process to text and uh, history. So text and history, in the way we deal with the texts, the way we are, what are the immutable teachings coming from the text, are both spiritual and rituals at the same time. We have things that are beyond time and space when it comes to, for example, El Ibadet, the, the worship, or uh, El Aqida, uh, uh, which are the principles of our faith. There are things that are transhistorical in the way we deal with, uh, with our sources and our texts. And this is part of principles and at the same time the spiritual uh, dimension that we have to rely on when it comes to our understanding of uh, our, uh, our religion. So here we can find in all the tradition, and we agree on this, that there are some dimensions that are transhistorical, immutable, in a spiritual way as well as in a ritual way and meaning the way we have to deal with them with our intellect when it is said in the Quran, Samyana wa Atana, we have heard and we obey. Some of these principles they are transhistorical. Now uh, uh, and this is both spiritual, transhistorical is the way, the process that you have to come to yourself. So the self reflection is part okay. Uh, the self-reflection has to do uh, with, uh, with something which is the only way for us to come close to God is to go through this process by respecting at the same time some principles and our way of dealing with our rationality is to go to know the limits of our rationality when it comes to the principles. Now, what is also important in the self-critical approach is that we have to take into account history. We have to take into account new context and new reality. For example, the challenges of self-reflections in our time are not exactly the same as in the past. And we can just we can we can repeat the term the same words, but that's not exactly the same experience. So the way we have to deal with uh, this uh, the, the reality around us is also to be self-critical uh, uh, to our history. The, the way we look at our history. So this critical approach towards uh, history is important. The second thing which is important, as I have only 15 minutes, I'm trying to go straight to some of the uh, essential things that I wanted to say. What is important in the way we are dealing with ourselves in a spiritual way as well as in a, uh, an intellectual way, it's uh, to be able also within history, because we are dealing with between text and history. What is divine? What is coming from the divine and what is human? And that's also is very important. Why? Because what we see in some of the traditions, in the Sufi tradition, but as well as in the uh, Fakhi tradition, is to sacralize sometimes what was said by human beings in history and confusing this with the divine. And I think that it's, it's as uh, dangerous in the spiritual uh, realm that it is in the legal realm or in the philosophical realm. What is divine and what is human? This self-critical approach is important even and very often, even for example, in Sufi circles, because we have exactly the same. It's in the name of self-reflection and uh, in the way they are close to God. This uh, lack of understanding here, a lack of uh, critical approach towards what is coming from the divine and what is coming from the human. Uh, in this perspective, it's also important. So you can see here that I'm not disconnecting the spiritual tradition from the intellectual tradition, and I think it's exactly the same process, based on the very understanding of what jihad means, what ishtihad could mean, and very importantly, the, 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 uh, the deep understanding of our tradition. And as I said, this is also to be critical and self-critical in anything which has to do with uh, it to us, knowing and trying to understand from where our trust is built 
and from where the human uh, contribution, the intellectual contribution, the scholarly contribution, still it's a human product, it's a human agency, and we have to divide this, to, to, to divide this, to, to differentiate this from the what is divine. Having said that, and, and getting to that uh, that point, I wanted to, to say a, a few things. As a, a, once again, it's an introduction to a deeper discussion here, when it comes to uh, also self-criticism. Um, what uh, I think we have to do in this, in uh, uh, trying to get uh, this self-reflection should be part of all our senses, of Islam. All the theological, theological approaches have to do with this self-reflection, everywhere. If self-reflection is a way for us to be better human beings, meaning more ethical in the way we behave, and this is why we all agree in all the tradition, from the Sufi to the to the third, from the Sufi tradition to the uh, third tradition, we agree that at the end, all the teachings have to do with come back to the self, improve your relationship to God, and improve your behavior. Those who believe and are trying to, to do good deeds, that's the essence of self-reflection. Self-reflection is just not to, to be close to God uh, in a void. It's what are the ways through which we have to go to come close to him. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the reality of the, the, or the objective of the spiritual journey and this uh, understanding of Tawheed. Now if you read all what the scholars said in their respective fields in our history, it's uh, also something which is important and that we have to realize. What I'm saying, there is no true self reflection in scholarly terms if we don't come to a self-critical approach towards our legacy. This is what I'm saying and that I, I started to say. And by saying, for example, is uh, how do we read the texts? So in which way the text should be read in order for us to go through this experience? So it means, for example, that uh, uh, we have to read the text as subject, as free subject as free believers. And it means here that we have also to be uh, able to be critical towards uh, what came from our history, what came from other scholars, and also to question the categorization of sciences that we have in our tradition. Because today, unfortunately, in the Muslim world, uh, among Muslims, the main science is now, and when we are referring to authority among scholars, is very often the fuqaha, the jurists. So it means that the legal framework through history took over among all the sciences. And if the legal is taking over, very often what is going to be faithfulness to the text is going to be the rules, what in fact the rules are means to help us to achieve this self-reflection about improving our being. So the categorization of knowledge, it's important in our society. Why, for example, in a specific time, some scholars started to say, give up with philosophy, be careful uh, with tasawwuf, uh, uh, Sufis, be careful with uh, uh, even ilm al-kalam. Ilm al-kalam, one of the other way of talking about ilm al-kalam is also the thing, is the fundamentals of what religion is all about. And even to the point that even you have a, a, a great uh, a scholar saying all the other sciences are in fact connected to ilm al-kalam, also al and even fiqh. It's a part of uh, uh, the process. So, so uh, you find this in uh, uh, in uh, in scholars, where from Abu Hamid al Ghazali to Ibn Taymiyyah, having this approach about uh, uh, also the very essence of this discussion. Uh, yeah. So understanding the categorization of knowledge. So I don't want to come with a very narrow understanding of self-reflection at the individual level. It's the whole tradition that is questioned through what are the ultimate goal of this self-reflection when it comes to the self, when it comes to a community uh, uh, process, when it comes to our history, knowing how central this uh, is. Oh, five minutes? You, you showed me the five minutes or not yet? Not yet? Okay. Uh, uh, the self-critical approach should be also about the categorization and the hierarchy between the, the sciences that we have within the tradition and, and I think that this is what we have to do. 
not to disconnect the individual uh, journey towards uh, coming to the self from our connection to the text, knowing what is divine and what is human, our reading of the text, the categorization of knowledge and sciences in our tradition. Uh, once again, I'm saying this uh, within an, an academic setting here, uh, I would say it's clear that uh, ordinary Muslims are going to, not going to go through all this. <coughs> what I understood from our meeting is to come from a simple question, questioning uh, deeply the tradition. How do we deal with it? How do we deal with this understanding? And this is where uh, I, I would say we also have, in a critical way, a self-critical way, self-criticism, not only of the self, but on our tradition, when it comes to uh, reading the scholars in our uh, 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 tradition from the beginning, and uh, uh, to also be able to put some uh, priority of to be selective with what was said, depending on the context, depending on their own priorities, on understanding how we are going to deal with this uh, in the way we uh, deal with this, the text. Having said this, uh, I would say that one of the the thing that uh, one of the things that uh, is sometimes m missing in, in our way of dealing with uh, the, the spiritual journey and the intellectual challenges that we have is to take seriously the context. What in fact it was there at the very beginning. If uh, you read the Muatla from uh, Mali, you can see that the context, the, the environment was everywhere in what he was producing, to the point that he was putting himself, uh, 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 in, he was involved in uh, what he was saying when he was talking about uh, uh, a tradition in Amru and in, uh, he, he was talking about what is our take on the issue when he was involved in the, in the context. And I would say today, when we are dealing with a global consumerist society, a global culture, global realities that are transcending and going beyond our national identities and national uh, reality, to speak about self-reflection in a narrow sense without taking into account the global context and what are the new challenges, how you are going, and especially, you know, we are fasting these days and the Muslims are very much colonized by the consumerist spirit within Ramadan and during Ramadan. By the way they eat, by the way they eat too much, by the way they are some, uh, the two countries that are increasing their eating process during Ramadan, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Morocco. And I think that when you come to self-reflection about the meaning of things, self-reflection means put the meaning. So come back to the meaning. It's come back to the meaning of what you are doing. Come back to the meaning of rules. Come back to the, the meaning of your philosophical take. Come back to the meaning of the whole, the, the cosmology that you are living in. And, and you have to deal with the context. Meaning that when we are facing our context, to come back to the tradition, and I'm taking the tradition very seriously, very seriously. I think that we have to be serious with all what, what came from the medieval uh, uh, scholars, our deep tradition, but not in a way which is coming back to repeat what they said on self-reflection. It's to come back to what they said on self-reflection and how it works for us in our context and up what are our priorities today. And the priorities today could be quite different in the way we are dealing with. So sometimes, you know, old right answer for a time could be wrong answer for our time. And sometimes it's not about the, 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 the answers, it's about the priorities that we have in some of our uh, uh, understanding. And, and, and this is why I think that we have to be self-critical with our tradition in the light of our context, knowing what are the challenges of our time. Knowing, for example, in times of what we are talking about, uh, self-reflection, we have lots of uh, psychological problems within the Muslim communities around the world, and especially in the West. Lots of spiritual, sp psychological problems. So, so we have to deal with this. This is not just, you know what, you have to pray. I have a, a solution for you. Read again. Yahya Ulum din you will get all the solutions. There are lots of things in Yahya Ulum din it's, it's, it's a treasure. But the way it's put, the way it's thought for a specific time, it's a specific time. So now you have to read even the tafsir. Why do we have a tafsir almost every century? Because the tafsir is explaining the Quran. It's not only explaining the Quran 
in to understand what it meant in the time of the revelation, but it means for us today. So self-reflection is the way you read the Quran, taking into account what our uh, 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 former scholars are giving us, but also to be in this way also uh, quite uh, 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 critical and creative. I think that in a very traditional discourse on self-reflection, I think that we are not enough creative in the way we are connecting this discourse to a specific context. Uh, and this is why I think you can't speak about self-reflection if you don't, are not talking about self-critical approaches towards our text, towards our legacy and our scholars. Uh, and even, even, uh, the, uh, 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 when it comes to the Sufi tradition and when it comes to the philosophical tradition. The last thing that I wanted to say is that uh, uh, it's important when it comes to, to this at a, an individual level as well as an intellectual, at, at collective level, to reconnect this discussion about self-reflection with priorities, which are our priorities when it comes to this, at a personal level and intellectual level. And I would say that the priorities of our time, let me put it frank, directly. I think that at a very specific period of time, to put as a priority, el fiqh was essential. This was the way the Muslims understood they would protect themselves. To put it now as the only way to protect ourselves from the surrounding global world, I think it's a mistake. To reconsider self-reflection as coming back to meaning and understand that the legal issues are means and not goals, that I think it's essential. So we have to re. So you know, I have still one minute. Uh, so, so these are the priorities, and, and we have to define this. Be careful in this discussion, and even about uh, you know when you are put under pressure, but the surrounding world telling you, you Muslims, you have extremists now, you have violent extremists all around. So the, the right way for you is to come back to a tasawwuf. Sufism is the right way. At the end, our priorities should be decided from within, not from people telling us what are your priorities for us. So I'm not talking about self-reflection as being a priority versus the legal just to please the people who are looking at us, but to come back to the essence of what is self-reflection and self-critical approach. That's important, and this is also something which is important. Self-reflection has to do with empowerment, liberation and emancipation from the self, from within, for ourselves, not under the pressure of uh, the global world telling us, you know, what in Islam you have to give this priority to this dimension because anything else it's bad. So, so when I'm saying that uh, the legal should, be, should not be the priority, and that I, I don't mean the legal is nothing. And when these people are saying you have to evolve and to be contemporary Muslims, I wouldn't accept anyone telling us that uh, our legacy has to be dismissed or has to be neglected. That's, for me, it's completely wrong. This, I'm, I'm saying rethink, be critical, but take it into consideration. Because in, in my understanding, when it comes to self-reflection and when it comes to self-criticism, there is no faithfulness without evolution. But evolution we decide from within in an emancipative way and not only to please people around us. Because what I see today was all this discussion about uh, how do we reform, how do we deal with the West, is something which is much more responding to calls from outside than to conditions and requirements from within. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramadan. A lot to think about. Uh, I'd like to call on Dr. Pavel Azim now. Uh, start Thank you. Thanks to the organizers uh, who took it upon themselves, um, especially in the summer months, longest days, uh, uh, to help bring people together to think about uh, topics such as this. Um, 
Looking to the audience, I must also uh, thank, uh, because uh, it was in the Islamic tradition, there's, there's also saying, who does not thank people, does not uh, thank uh, God. My own supervisor is uh, sitting here amongst the teacher and supervisor during my doctorate, so I'm with uh, Professor Christopher Melcher. Um, but I think it's actually uh, for two words, because I, I plan to begin with a couple of lines of poetry that were included in the introduction to a book by his own teacher, um, uh, George Muktasi, who wrote one of the most influential books uh, of the past century on education, historical approach to education in the Islamic world, and another book on humanism. And the idea of self-reflection and self-criticism um, uh, can be found, especially in, in the latter work, to come again and again. He begins um, his first book with two lines of the preface, with two lines of poetry from a 10th-century uh, poet from Central Asia, Abu Fatih al-Busti, um, where he says, يَا خَالِمَ الْجِسْمِ كَمْ تَشْقَى بِخِدْمَتِهِ لِتَطْلِبُ الْرِبْحَ مِمَّا فِيهِ خُسْرَانُ أَقْبِلْ عَلِ النَّفْسِ وَاسْتَكْمِلْ فَضَائِلَهَا فَأَنْتَ بِالنَّفْسِ لَا بِالْجِسْمِ إِنْسَانُ This poet says, O slave of the body, how you toil to serve it. Where there's nothing but loss, you seek to profit. Turn to the mind, this is George Marcus's translation of the term nafs, and we'll read it at this. Which you need to perfect, for you are a man, not by your body, but by your intellect, by the nafs. So, it's on, with this point that I'd like to uh, begin a small treatment of the uh, exploration of the idea of formations of the self. Um, and one word that got dropped when I sent the email with the title uh, a few weeks back was the word moral uh, self. Uh, the word moral. So what I'd like to do is to think about, uh, explore some of the institutions and traditions from the pre-modern Muslim context, uh, historically, and to think of to what they said or what they implied as to the formation of the moral self within um, these, these traditions. So to say this again, I'd like to talk about how the pre-modern Muslims thought about the self and how it was formed and informed and also to look at the institutions and traditions that sustained the formation of the moral self. With a particular angle as um, emphasis on education. So in order to treat these two related questions, um, I'm going to explore the relationship of the self first uh, within especially the uh, philosophical and mystical traditions, the relationship of the self to the whole of the human being, uh, that is to say, the relationship of ontology to psychology uh, in those traditions that treat the nafs. And secondly, to survey some of the institutions, both learned and popular, which impacted upon the formation of the moral self. Um, we'll perhaps leave then for the workshop uh, some space for reflecting on the possible avenues of inquiry that entail from the points that are raised in this presentation today. Um, I will warn you that the presentation will be a, a little bit concept and term heavy, um, but I'll do my best in um, trying to ensure that the, the English, the Arabic terms don't wash over us and uh, that we still walk away with something to, to work with. Um, the first point, like I, uh, as I indicated, that I'd like to talk about is the rootedness of Muslim psychology in the ontology of the self uh, within many of the pre-modern Muslim traditions. The question of the self and the part of the nafs, uh, as I'm translating it temporarily for now at least, and the possibility of the formation of a truly moral self through self-criticism and through other techniques um, was largely dealt with uh, firstly as a metaphysical question, which is to say that the authors felt that they must understand, that we must understand what the self, the nafs, truly is in order to understand how to perfect it or how to uh, approach it critically. Um, as uh, any survey of the text will show, uh, Muslim theologians, philosophers, mystics, jurists uh, of all stripes were preoccupied with, with this idea. Um, today, I'll be focusing also on those treatments that bear upon the question of self-criticism and practices which bear upon the formation of the moral self. And historically and traditionally, this was largely within the remit of the tradition that came to be known as the Sufi tradition. Um, so, to begin, this tradition makes a distinction between the outward and between the inward aspects of man, the vahir and the batin. 
or we could say between the outer form, the qalib, and between the inward, the qalb or the heart. Um, if we take, for example, the work of a 20th century Egyptian scholar, uh, Abdul Khalaf al Shabrawi, uh, who died just before, I think in 1947, if I'm not mistaken. Um, his work, though very recent, uh, modern one could say in, this, in the historical sense, reflects very nicely um, a long standing tradition which people like Muhammad al Ghazali and other, many others participated in. Um, he made a distinction between the two aspects of the soul or the nafs. Um, so I'll just give a, a brief sample from, from this text of his, uh, which has been translated into English as the degrees of the self. He says, in the name of God, the merciful and compassionate, the passional soul, and this is Shahwaniya, is that subtle vapor that exists behind life, sensory perception, and voluntary movements. This is what the philosophers call the vital spirit. So he begins by first demarcating then um, what animates the human. But then that's all he spends those few lines in treating that aspect, and he turns to his primary purpose of authoring his text. He says, the rational soul and nafs al is an essence which in itself is unrelated to matter, but is connected to it inasmuch as it acts upon it. This soul is that which is termed either inciting, reproachful, inspired, serene, contented, found pleasing, or perfect. And for those of you who are familiar with the Arabic, which underlies uh, these translations, many of these are terms that are derived directly out of the uh, Quran, in which various passages uh, talk about the way that the, the human soul, when directed towards the good, or directed towards its passions, or directed towards reflecting upon where it stands vis-a-vis -vis these two, um, takes on these different terms. Um, so, in the work of Shabrawi, in the works of others that precede him within this tradition, the uh, inward aspect of man, subtle body as he called it, uh, is of degrees. Uh, the first degree one that is often referred to is the rational mind, or the aql, that which helps one think through uh, and make sense, and uh, engage with uh, the experiences in which humans find themselves. The second is the nefs. Um, and again, I'll talk about how these all relate down to the issue of uh, self in a moment, which is to say the talking mind, or the psyche. Um, they say the talking mind, what is meant is the constant stream of consciousness that uh, at times uh, overwhelms other aspects of the human uh, constitution. And this is the self that in the Sufi tradition, technically speaking, the, the locus of blameworthy character traits. And finally, uh, the ruh or the qalb, which is to say the locus of praiseworthy traits, that which is directed towards something other than the passions, other than uh, the maintenance of what the body and of its pleasures. This is the faculty of cognition, of meanings, and of the realities of things. Um, so a predecessor of Shabrawi by nearly a thousand years, um, the uh, Central Asian Afghani scholar Pusheri, uh, he writes that the human then is body and spirit, for God created them in the employment of one another. Um, but he adds another layer which uh, has not been addressed yet. So the aql, the nafs, the ruh, uh, the mind, the rational mind, the talking psyche, the heart. He says there's also an, another aspect to the metaphysical constitution of man, which is the sir, the inmost being, untouched by change and by exigencies of the psyche or of the mere humanity, the bashariya, the animal aspects of the man, of man. Uh, it is the sir, the inmost being, that witnesses the absolute and power and majesty of God, um, and it is this inmost being over which man is meant to um, have oversight and direct to become a receptacle of the light of God. This small excursion into theology and into uh, the metaphysics, uh, the ontology of uh, man from a psychological perspective is just meant to serve as a launching point now for what is to follow. So to quickly summarize, the different aspects of the singular inward dimension of man, uh, referred most common to, uh, commonly as the self, of the nafs, 
we can, again, distinguish different aspects. So as uh, Al-Ghazali and others say, it's ultimately one reality. And this, when I refer to Al-Ghazali, it's, it's simply because his works are available in English, something that everybody can follow up on their own if they wish. And in one sense, these are aspects which have been uh, received throughout the generations and the centuries as uh, representing, especially the Sufi tradition, that the singular reality and inward reality of man is the soul when it is directed towards the good. The nafs can also mean the identity of the person, what you are and who you are. The self, the nafs, can also uh, mean the mind, the rational mind, the aql, the trapping mind, or the appetitive faculties. Um, in summary, the ability of a person to truly perceive the intelligible meaning of things by means of the intellect of the nafs is directly connected to the psychic and moral makeup of the person. And this is the point that before going now into uh, how the psychology was embedded, this moral vision was embedded into education, into practices and traditions, this is the one point that I wish to underscore that um, is perhaps universally uh, reflected throughout pre-modern Muslim writings on both ontology and psychology, which is that the two are intimately related. You cannot develop a psychology in, uh, to, in by which self-criticism and self-reflection can take place without understanding the Quranic uh, framework uh, using the language of, uh, uh, of the, the language of the terms that we've just uh, heard. Without understanding this, there can be no uh, true <coughs> psychology. So with this point now, I wish to turn to the second point of the presentation, which is on how these notions were embedded and embodied within the moral vision of uh, Muslim education. And when I speak about education here, I mean it in two senses. Both, number one, in the formal sense, which is to say institutions of learning, such as primary education, such as colleges, and also in the broader sense of moral education of the individual self, in which there were many uh, high and uh, learned, as well as popular practices uh, throughout the Muslim world and various traditions. So the question then is, how is the worldly identity of the self constructed and informed? What serves to constitute an ideal, in the terms of um, moral psychologists or moral educa uh, educationalists, what serves to constitute an ideal or dreaded self? What moral categories are referenced and how do they become so referenced? Um, towards perhaps beginning an exploration of these questions, which we hopefully will do more in the uh, afternoon session, um, I'd like to make a distinction between two uh, terms which I will be using uh, throughout this presentation. Anyway. The disciplining of the self uh, and the formation of the self. The disciplining of the self, uh, in the, especially in the pre-modern Muslim tradition, reflects the internal factors, those aspects which the individual is meant to uh, pursue practices and techniques in order to reflect upon where one stands in one's journey, one's uh, sayer, in life. The formation of the self I use to refer to the external factors, the societal factors, how institutions and societal practices impact upon how, the indivi how an individual sees themselves, understands themselves, and situates themselves um, within uh, society and ultimately in relation to man and uh, the fellow man and God. The, again, uh, just as very quick typologies, and this is all that one can really do within a half hour presentation, so forgive me if this is a little bit uh, quick. Um, look, we begin with the internal factors, the arts of self uh, discipline, one could say. Uh, there are a number of uh, well, an endless number of techniques that were developed uh, throughout the 1400-year um, tradition, um, and especially from the rise of the 3rd and 4th centuries, in which various moral, psychological um, uh, disciplines were developed by scholars such as uh, al al Muhasibi, um, uh, Ghazali, whose name has already been mentioned, and others. But perhaps in relation to the idea of self-criticism, um, uh, four stand out particularly. One such art uh, is, the, is known as ma'rifat al-nafs, the intimate knowledge of the human self, 
both on the ontological levels that uh, were briefly touched upon previously, but also in the sense of under each individual understanding what, who they are and how they uh, are made up. In other words, uh, what causes one person to take in one way and another in a completely different way. So, ma'rifat in nafs, individual knowledge of the human self. The second is muraqal, uh, or keeping watch over the heart. Uh, both to see in which ways it is inclined towards good and in which ways it is uh, inclined towards iniquity. The third uh, term is mujahada, or the struggling uh, with the, the self, with the nafs. Um, and the final term, of which the aforementioned scholar of Muhammad al Muhasibi took his, his, um, his name as it were, was his muhasada, introspective uh, examination. The dealing with the self is to say that it is to negotiate with it. And uh, so, with the, uh, in, in numerous commentaries on works like the Risale of Kosher and others, um, it is mentioned that when the scholars say that one must slay the nefs, they say this is a metaphorical thing because it cannot be slayed, it cannot die. Rather, one has to be wise in, one, in, in the way that one negotiates with this nefs, with the ego, by not comprising on any essential notions, but by treating it gently and intelligently um, through these uh, various techniques, the intimate knowledge of one's own self, through keeping watch over it, through struggling against its iniquities, um, and through internal examination, through self-reflection of, of muhasaba. And it is by giving it what it needs, while at the same time, like a, a powerful stallion, reining it in when it wants to bolt off in the wrong direction, that one can ultimately bring it to serve as a riding mount, a very common metaphor, uh, in one's journey towards uh, God. These are some of the internal um, parts or disciplines um, that were talked about in, uh, again, in works from the 2nd and 3rd century up into uh, our own day, the 20th century, with the example of Shabrawi that I gave earlier. These things were also, however, uh, institutionalized over time into various traditions and schools. Um, when speaking about the Sufi tradi tradition specifically, uh, these came to be known by the 5th century, 6th century of the Hijra, 11th century of the Common Era, as Toruk, as, as uh, Sufi paths. Each path taking its name from a, a so-called eponymous founder, or more often than not, somebody who later uh, <coughs> disciples uh, associated their teachings with. with. Um, but the key point here is to say that in trying to make these internal arts functional and institutionalized, there were also a number of uh, uh, techniques that were common to all of these uh, traditions, and which they all emphasized. The first, of, um, the first one is suhbah, or keeping fellowship with masters who have traveled this path of self-reflection self before one. The second, in keeping the company of such people, is mudhakara, or the regular um, meeting for spiritual teachings uh, that help the individual then reflect upon where they stand, and upon which aspects of their own self-formation and reformation still require some work. And the final uh, aspect, which is common to all of these various uh, tarifas, are various forms of litanies, or dhikr, adhkar, and awrad. Um, again, when I say this is not to make a historical statement that um, any one of these things only happened in the 6th or 7th century of the Hijra. Um, these things we find from the very, uh, very earliest days of the Muslim tradition. But it's to say that they were systematized in particular fashions um, in accordance with the uh, temperaments of the, of the people, the scholars, the peoples in whom that they were engaged, and indeed with the times and the context in which they lived. Now, this is as far as the Sufi tradition and as, as to the, the tariqas, the uh, Sufi paths. On the level of formal education, which is to say the colleges of law and the other forms of colleges that uh, developed over time, such as colleges of, um, of uh, the study of the 
scriptural sources of Islam, or even the colleges of medicine, and other, other uh, forms of higher education. The same notions of suhba, of companionship, were also central there. Um, and whereas the formal dimensions of higher learning, um, in which notions of ta'lim and tadris were at the center, ta'lim meaning the um, formal uh, passing and transmission of knowledge, tadris originally indicating the lecturing in law, but then which went on to indicate any form of formal uh, lecturing and transmission of knowledge. Nonetheless, these, even in this formal context, uh, if we look at works such as the uh, 14th century um, manual on education and the adab, the etiquette of education um, by Badr Din ibn Jama'a, who wrote his text in the context of, not, of recently professionalized learning in an era in which colleges had come to dominate cities like Cairo, like Damascus, and Nishapur, where just a couple of hundred years previous to this, uh, colleges in that formal sense had not existed. The rise of these colleges led to um, new challenges, new ways of ensuring that the emphasis on propriety, on edit, on um, proper comportment, proper attitude, the ability to ensure that the professionalization of knowledge did not mean that the process of self-reflection and self-criticism was uh, left behind. Authors like Ibn Jama'ah authored works in order to re-situate these techniques that we've heard about earlier, these internal and external um, social um, practices within the newly professionalized context of their, of their own age. And so they emphasized the notions of tarbiya, of nurturing, of rearing the individual, of ta'deeb, of inculcating virtues, of moral discipline, even in a professional, uh, uh, particularly in a professional context. Which is to say they tried to ensure that whatever opportunities may have raised by, arose from uh, the professionalized uh, learning, world of professionalized learning, that those who came through the gates of the madrasas still had the opportunities and still understood the importance of a principled programmatic approach to character formation. A question which uh, perhaps um, when I've spoken to educationalists today uh, is something that in the, our own context uh, uh, perhaps commercialized and Commercialized education, let's just leave that, that for now, uh, is, still, is, is a question which moral uh, philosophers and moral education especially are struggling with today. Um, how was this done? Uh, there's been a recent work published just a few years ago, which um, I would encourage those who are interested in these topics to look at, by uh, Professor Rudolf uh, T. Ware. Uh, published in 2014, titled The Walking Quran, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge, and History in West Africa. As you can tell from uh, the title, his focus is indeed on um, West Africa, uh, historically and contemporarily. But the primary, uh, the reason I mention is for this notion of embodied knowledge, which is, is, is to say, um, how was it that the transferring, not just the formal knowledge, but also of these internal qualities and of the practices in which ensure uh, self-reflection and self-criticism uh, were passed on. And in this work, he makes the, his primary argument is that regardless of the uh, various times in which uh, Muslim education was practiced in West Africa and beyond that, he, he references Egypt and other places as well, that the corporea uh, corporeality of the embodiment of knowledge was a central aspect as, as to how it was transmitted and how, and how moral virtue was cultivated in the individual um, through these processes. Um, so he gives, just as an example, the term hafif, which is usually denotes a, someone who has memorized the Qur'an. Um, but philologically, as well as historically, he shows how this was understood in West African societies, not merely to mean to memorize, but to carry, to protect, to guard, and to keep the book, uh, which is to say the Holy Book of the Quran, within the self. And 
he underscores this uh, point by showing that then the memorization of the Quran, the keeping of it within the self, is intimately tied to the ability for the, of the person through the journey of memorizing um, and keeping company uh, with their teachers uh, who are the, of, of the Quran to also shed off the various moral and um, blameworthy traits in order to be uh, worthy receptacles themselves of the divine word. Um, and that the various, even West African non-Arabic languages also took on terms to indicate that the Quran, when it is carried by the person, becomes uh, part and parcel of who the person uh, is. That's the title of his work, The Walking Quran, to indicate that these people, um, in reference to an early hadith of the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, in which he said that he was um, the walking, you know, a walking Quran. Um, so, a number of the ways in which this uh, was done will leave for uh, the uh, discussion in the afternoon. Um, but, but I'd like to end with just certain lines of inquiry. I mean, this was a very um, quick touching upon certain concepts and historical practices. Um, but the types of things I think I'd like to explore in our afternoon uh, session especially, um, and to benefit from those who come from uh, not necessarily historical perspectives, but from those dealing with education or from, um, from other uh, disciplines, are questions such as what kind of self do the uh, different practices, forms of discipline, and forms of discipline produce? What kinds of cultures of learning elicit a particular type of moral personality? Um, when we talk about self-criticism, or indeed self-reform, what does this mean in relation to, for example, uh, more historically modern uh, attempts at social engineering, uh, both in the Muslim world and beyond. In other words, where education uh, has been adopted for the purposes of building, let's say, the nation state or other visions of society, which we see from starting in the 16th century with various Calvinist thinkers um, and onward. So in this very brief presentation, I did not address issues of the um, individual self versus the collective, nor the political dimensions of the self, all of these things, again, can be said to follow um, and are concomitants of what we talked about earlier. But I think it is nonetheless instructive when reflecting upon the pre-modern um, tradition's uh, emphasis on moral formation in moral education at every uh, level, whether in the um, popular Sufi tariqas or whether in the formation of um, higher learning, that there is uh, a close connection between the Qur'anic and other Islamic visions of the human self on an ontological level, between practices of self-reflection and self-criticism uh, and moral improvement on the psychological um, uh, level, and between the four types of practices and institutions which facilitate this embodying of uh, the moral vision. Um, so perhaps in, this, in our own age of an industrialized um, and increasingly corporatized learning, uh, it might be important to explore the human scale of education and uh, for those so interested, what the Muslim educational tradition um, so heavily emphasizes as to the role of formal education, uh, more formation, and thus ultimately to the, posi the position of self-reflection and self-criticism in creating a truly human and humane society. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Talal. Uh, I'd like now to call on Dr. Nigel to give his presentation. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak, uh, and thank you very much to, to the previous two presenters for speaking, and thank you very much to everyone who's, who's come here today to listen. Um, my background, let me just start this slideshow properly. Yeah. Uh, my background in this is certainly not as uh, an expert on Islam in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it's really as, as an educationalist, someone who, who carries out education research in contemporary schools, in contemporary settings. So, pick up some of those, those recent challenges and comments um, that you've just put, put out. 
Um, and I think also it, it picks up with the invitation from Amina initially and her background in, in considering the nature of learning uh, for Muslim students in, in Germany at the moment. So I, I, was decided, I decided to start with that kind of view, that kind of perspective on this. Uh, and what we'll do is kind of look at some of the things, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities that have come up about in terms of processes of self-reflection in, in contemporary education and then try and hold those up against the kinds of traditions that the two previous speakers have, have outlined so, so eloquently. Um, first, we'll start with a question for you, though, uh, which is to think of education in, in quite policy terms, quite economic terms. Which of the following categories of work skills have increased or decreased most rapidly over the last 40 years? Is it routine manual work, kind of factory work? Is that a kind of work, that sort of thing, where you do manual work very, very routinely, the same thing all the time? Is it non-routine manual work? Is it the kind of thing like um, delivery drivers, where it's a manual process, but actually it's not just the same thing all the time? Some kinds of agricultural work are non-routine in this way. Is it routine cognitive work? Is that the kind of uh, clerical work or secretarial work which requires some kind of cognitive ability, but is fairly kind of fairly routine in how it happens? Is it more kind of complex communication? Is it about a kind of communicative skill? Uh, is that something which has increased or decreased the most? Uh, or is it in expert thinking or problem solving? So I won't ask you to discuss it, but certainly you may have particular views of your own as to which you think is going to come out on top as being the, the thing that's increased the most uh, and the one which has decreased the most. Um, the results um, from a few years ago now are as follows. What's increased the most is complex communication. We require on that more and more now. That's, that's a, a great area of, of growth in terms of jobs uh, particularly through social media. We have people to advise us, to present things for us. Interestingly now, the whole issue of how politicians handle spin is a reason for criticising them. Not the issue itself, but actually how well or badly they handled that issue politically. We, th we look at communications being something which matters in itself. Expert thinking has also increased greatly. Uh, there's a lot more demands for different kinds of experts. New kinds of expert thinking have become important. Areas of expertise have become much more specialised. If you look at, for instance, uh, legal sector, there are many more different kinds of lawyers. And the kinds of training that you could assume all lawyers to have in 1970 don't really apply anymore. So there's questions around those kinds of things. Uh, the next one on this, is, is uh, which isn't at the bottom, is, is routine manual. Now what's interesting is, is actually you might have assumed that those kinds of routine manual works are the things that would have been decreased the most. And although they have decreased in importance, they still retain some kind of significance. They're still important in some way that there are certain kinds of routine jobs which get carried out. Similarly also, non-routine manual work um, is, is not it is not the thing that has diminished the most. It, dimin it was for a, for a few years, but actually somehow it's, 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 it's moved into second from last place. So we still require certain kinds of jobs. We still require certain kinds of things uh, which require some elements of, of thought, but are essentially manual work. The thing that has decreased the most is routine cognitive work. So the kinds of things, the kind of secretarial work, clerical work, that has been completely replaced by technology, actually, more so than anything else, which is kind of striking. So the kinds of jobs that require some kind of mental process, but were actually quite routine, are actually what's missed out. Um, and that's kind of interesting because that has, that has very important educational implications as to what we want out of education. Uh, and you can see this from this. What we want are the, are the more advanced skills. Uh, we want complex communication. We want expert thinking. With, there is still a need for people with manual skills. But actually, what's missing is the sense of, of what some sort of um, basic education might provide. And the kinds of people who would leave school with a basic education and get some sort of office-based job, that no longer exists. Um, so there's more to it in the sense of, of the kinds of complexities that are involved. We demand, we have, there are demands for more complex kinds of skills now. We, we expect um, more complexity in work. 
We're confronting new kinds of problems. Uh, there are new kinds of work. Three of the most popular new jobs available are app developers. Well, they didn't exist a few years ago. I mean, they wouldn't have existed at the time actually that original graph was produced. Millennial generational experts. That's an expert on people who were born at the start of the millennium. Um, what, are, what are those people going to be like in the future? How do we plan for those people in the future? Uh, related to this, actually, the other kind of expert is, is an expert on old age. As people live longer, we're going to have, to have more people who focus on what happens in old age. Sustainability experts is also a growth area in terms of thinking about that, thinking about uh, the long term in terms of sustainable development for all kinds of people. So there's new kinds of work. Uh, there's new kinds of working. A lot of people, most people are probably likely to have 10 employers before they're 40. Now, 30 years ago, that was unheard of. You would join an organisation, you would work for it for your life, you would retire, you would be given a clock or whatever it was you got when you retired, and that was it. So, uh, rapid movement through different kinds of jobs. And not just different kinds of jobs or employers, different careers in themselves. Um, speaking of someone who was on their third career, um, originally I was a lawyer, then I became a teacher, now I'm an academic. You know, I, I, I'm sort of guilty as charged on this particular account. But that's, that's more and more common. People will move out of different professions, different careers, and different, different stages of their lives. How we work online, in the office, has become more important. It's no longer important to go to your place of work anymore. You can work from home, do your, your stuff there online, go in if you need to, maybe do a Skype call or not. So we work differently. You know, and when do we retire? That's now up for grabs. That's now becoming increasingly later, um, and people retire a little bit, or they, they then go into consultancy work. That whole notion of working to an age and then stopping has also come up for question. So these kinds of issues raise interesting kind of educational implications. Um, firstly, just to highlight again, that notion of having a basic education and then leaving school at 16 or 18 and getting a job is kind of inadequate. That's the sector that's been most hit. Actually, employment-wise, you're better off having less education and getting a manual job uh, than you are by, by, by getting some kind of education um, and, then, and then not being able to find work. On the other hand, what has increased is further kinds of higher education, you know, the numbers of people doing masters now is clearly increased. The numbers of people doing doctorates now is clearly increased from when it was in the 1960s or 70s. They're kind of easier to do because we have the technology to allow us to do it. Um, but actually, there's, there's issues around that. But that, that basic education that people would have been happy with and seen as being more than enough 20, 30, 40 years ago is no longer, is no longer valid or, or as useful as it used to be. Um, and the implication of this is really lifelong learning in all sorts of ways. One is the notion of professional development. We now expect people who have a professional work to get better at what they do. We expect them to be able to improve what they do, uh, to be up to date. We expect our doctors to be up to date, to be up to date with current medicine. We expect lawyers to be up to date with legal practice. In all sorts of ways, we expect people to be, to be able to, to do what they do better, to keep up to date to refine and develop their practices. Uh, and, and Donald Schoen's famous work, The Reflective Practitioner, in the 80s was a way of articulating that process. He, he tried to set out a way of talking about a difference between reflection in action, the kind of things that you do when you're doing your job, and then reflection on action, which is when you stand back and think about your career as a whole. So a kind of an articulation of, of a way of reflecting on, on work. Career change also has an implication in terms of lifelong learning. We need to be able to access education at different stages of our careers now. It's no longer enough to go to university at the age of 18, leave at 21 with your degree, and that's an end to it. We need to be able to go back, come back, to study part-time, to do all those kinds of things. Uh, and also, people learn things for recreation these days. You know, this department has a vast department of continuing education, which offers professional development, but a lot of what they're offering is for people who simply want to do another bit of study in something else. You know, people who decide they want to know, learn another language. That's also part of our educational system. So there's ways in which what we want out of education has changed significantly. And what's become really significant within that is what we might call learning how to learn. That's become hugely important in the field of education studies and in terms of what we expect of, of pupils and what we expect of students. 
Um, and it's manifested in, in a, a range of different ways. Uh, one important notion was that of self-regulation, which uh, Zimmerman produced in the early 80s and, and into the early 90s particularly. The notion of the self-regulating learner, someone who can, who can understand what it is they have to do in order to learn. That sort of trend was picked up, particularly in this country, uh, by work within the field of assessment. What we expect out of, out of assessment processes, and um, particularly the notion of self-assessment, that young people uh, of any age and students are able to actually make assessment judgments about the quality of the work they've produced or where they're up to. Uh, that's supported by, often by notions of feedback. I suspect most of you as students would expect to get feedback on pieces of work you've written. You would expect some comments about how to improve it uh, in some kind of way. Because in a sense you're part of this culture too. It's not enough to be told, oh well, it's a first or it's a second. You know, that doesn't help you do anything with it. Uh, you, will, you will want to demand something else because you will be wanting to improve your own work in some way. Um, and you will also want to be able to judge for yourself what kind of, what kind of level you think it is too. So there's those kinds of, kinds of ideas. Um, there's also linked to that the notion of growth mindset, uh, which is quite popular educationally at the moment from Carol Dweck's work, uh, in which she contrasted people with a growth mindset with people what she called a helpless mindset. Um, and it, it's interesting in that some students who do very well but only get grades uh, or levels or whatever often find it very hard when they get to a different kind of educational institution. So people who go through schools, performing very well, getting A grades, getting 100%, can get to university and come unstuck because they didn't know why they did what they did well. They couldn't actually articulate that for themselves. Whereas actually students who perhaps performed less well but were more aware of the processes were, were much better at actually improving themselves after that. Um, and another recent manifestation of this kind of, these kinds of ideas is in the notion of the expert learner. The person who can actually learn anything because they've got the right kinds of, of mentality to doing that. They can, can approach the process of learning in a particular way which allows them to take these ideas forward. So um, a range of different kinds of, of strategies that are there and possible. Um, and an interest in this, this has become important really from, from a young age, from very young children, uh, five, six-year-olds right the way through, to make sense of these kinds of processes, to make sense of how they learn. Um, so what's become important is a kind of reflection on learning for, for students, um, the valuing of that, seeing of that is important, particularly if you think of, of those, those issues around the kinds of work that people would be expected to do um, after that. So what kinds of things that are required in this? What are the kinds of, of activities, the kinds of elements um, of self-regulation, if you broadly call it that, although I've, I've used a number of other terms as well. Well, these are kinds of metacognitive processes, uh, as they're generally called, generally seen as having four main components. The first is that you're aware of your current attainment or performance. You, you need to know how well you're doing at the moment. Um, that's important. You need to know what the optimal attainment, attainment or performance is being. What is, what is the thing that you need to be able to reach to? What is the, what is the next thing that you need to be able to, to get to beyond your current attainment? So those two um, in themselves aren't enough. I might know I'm working at a C grade, um, and I might know I want to get an A grade, but if I don't know how to do anything to fill that gap, then actually that's not going to get me there. And that's the problem, if you like, with the helpless students who were getting A grades but didn't know how they did it. So you need awareness of how to bridge the gap between your current, um, your current attainment and your target attainment. Um, and that's not just knowing the grade, it's about understanding the criteria. What is it that you're being judged on educationally? What is it that actually is determining how well or badly you're doing at algebra or geometry or whatever? Um, and clearly also, you actually need the motivation to do it. You know, you could say, well, I'm, I'm getting this, I'm getting that, I know what I've got to do, but do you know what, I've just got other things to do. You know, there's a great party I've got to go to instead in Christchurch and I just can't be bothered to sort it out. That might be the approach that you, you decide to take. So you need the motivation, um, which picks up with um, uh, Amina's work, particularly around the notion of resilience. You know, we sometimes talk about buoyancy. 
of, of students as well, that they can deal with comments and criticisms and, and, and take, that, take things forward. So you need the motivation to, to achieve it as well. Um, on top of that, not really part of the uh, metacognitive processes, you clearly need the resources and the opportunities to, to do that. You need to be given those in order to, to achieve things. Um, and I'm just, clearly, there were kind of religious and moral reflections we've already heard commented on. Um, are not necessarily the same as these. There is some kind of overlap, perhaps, um, and I'm certainly not going to explore them here, but, but you can see how different kinds of approaches, different ways of thinking about these things, come at these kinds of problems in, in um, parallel, uh, different kinds of ways. So um, I just want to highlight at that point that, that, kind of, that kind of issue in terms of what we think about in terms of the religious and moral reflection, and the kinds of ways of understanding these things that are currently happening, happening uh, educationally. Uh, it gets more complicated, however, because part of this push towards self-regulation is actually part of a wider thrust towards neoliberal education, in which other kinds of processes are underway as well, particularly the notion of kind of high-stakes testing. Because we demand more of people, because we're looking for these expert thinkers, we want them to think in this kind of quite elaborate way. We nevertheless also want them to do well in exams and in tests, and however we define them. And that's created a kind of problem of knowledge in terms of assessment, um, partly because in some ways our ways of assessing lag behind the kinds of skills that we're looking for. You know, it matters to countries now where they are in what's called the PISA rankings, you know, the international rankings of, of, of countries. Um, and that creates a kind of tension, really, between the process of teaching to the test, how are you going to get pupils to perform well, against these kind of quite subtle processes that we want to have in terms of pupils being able to regulate their learning. Um, and examination criteria are you know, what we use educationally to, for pupils to understand, but they're imperfect kinds of things because they don't reflect the depth and complexities of the kinds of, the kinds of criteria, if you like, that we've already heard elaborated. Um, the newspaper cutting, I think, is it's from a, a Pakistani newspaper describing uh, exam preparations in Karachi last year, identifying three kinds of students in these kind of high-stakes testing situations. Uh, so the more ambitious students busy themselves in perfecting their rote-learned answers through the preparation notes provided by popular tuition centres. These are the diligent students who kind of learn it by, learn it off by rote, learn it by heart. Others who find cramming the bulk of these notes a daunting task go out to buy a handy combination of the last five years solved papers along with guest papers. So these people are kind of, you know, kind of doing it a little bit as, you know, trying to get by as best they can. And then there's the third breed of students who do not even bother with the solved or guest papers. For them, the infamous pocket guides, which are an abridged version of solved papers, come in handy for copying answers during the exams, provided that they do not get caught by the invigilator. So, you know, the kind of the economy of cheating, if you like, you know, people who've got another strategic way of getting through exams. So um, these kinds of processes clearly mitigate against self-regulation of learning. These are, these are, in a sense, all either diligent or panic responses to the kinds of tests which students throughout the world are now being presented with. 